In this short meeting, we're going to talk about nonlinear models. And specifically, we're going to focus on applications centered around population dynamics. Now, we saw some primitive population models, probably in Calculus 2, and we barely touched on them previously in the course. Now, this model is valid for small populations over short time intervals. So if you are counting bacteria in a Petri dish, it's still a pretty good model over short time intervals. But if we want a more realistic model, uh, we can replace this constant growth rate with a function which depends on the population. And we'll see, there's different choices for this function. We're going to focus on a linear choice. All these models are based on the density dependent hypothesis, which I didn't spell correctly. So let me fix that. Uh, and that just simply assumes that the rate of change in the population depends on P only and not on the time variable. Uh, and note that this uh, differential equation is an autonomous differential equation, which we've studied previously. So we're going to refer back to those uh, studies that we made. So if we assume that the environment of a population has a maximum number of individuals that it can support and that we're going to use capital K to represent that number of individuals. K is called the carrying capacity of the environment. And so, so let's think about this. Um, this would say that uh, when the population is K, then F of K should be zero. So once the population reaches or has K individuals, uh, no further growth is going to be po uh, possible. It has reached its maximum. Uh, if we think back to our autonomous differential equations, that would mean that K is a critical number of the autonomous differential equation. And all critical numbers are constant solutions, which means if you ever reach that, then you would never leave that population according to this model. It would simply stay at k individuals. So let's impose an initial condition. Let's assume that uh, at time equals 0, our population growth rate is r and that uh, f is a linear equation. So it's just simply a constant times p plus another constant. So now we have two conditions on f. We know that f of 0 equals r and f of k equals 0. So we should be able to determine the constants c1 and c2. So let's start with the fact that f of 0 equals r. That tells me that uh, C2 must equal R. And if I replace C2 with R, and then I say, oh, F of K must equal zero. So zero on the left-hand side equals C1 times K plus R. I can solve that to get C2 is minus R over K. So now I have my model for the population. Now, this is exactly the same as the logistic, I should call this logistic equation, which we have studied before. And it just has different constants. Instead of A and B, we now have R and R over K. So we'll just stick with A and B for the next part of our exploration. A solution to a logistic equation is a logistic function, and the graph is called a logistic curve. Uh, we can solve this equation, the 
logistic equation with the A and the B or with the R and the R over K using separation of variables. I'm not going to go through all the steps. It's in the book uh, and there's some uh, algebra involved. Now we're going to say that the initial population, so the initial population is different from the initial value of our function f, but our initial value, our initial population is p naught, and p naught cannot equal a over b. If I use those conditions, then I can solve the logistic equation and get this solution function. Uh, why can't p not equal a over b? Well, recall that a over b, p equals a over b, is a critical point for this function. It would be a constant solution. So if p not were to equal a over b, this formula would be incorrect because the solution would be p of t equals a over b for all values of t. So let's see, we found some information about uh, the solution curves. Remember we used that phase portrait to determine when the P was increasing or decreasing. And we realized that there was asymptotic behavior with the critical numbers. And we can get more information. We can find information from the second derivative, which will tell us something about the concavity. So if I take the second derivative of our model, not the second derivative of this function, that would be too much work and unnecessary. But if we take this, the, the derivative, I'm sorry, of our model, that will give me the second derivative on the left-hand side. Now, in order to take the derivative of the right-hand side, I could have multiplied this out and you'll get the same answer, but I just chose to use the product rule. So the derivative of the first one is dp dt times the second one, which is a minus bp. If I take the uh, derivative of the second one, I'll get minus b dp dt, and that'll get multiplied by the first, which is p. Now what I can do is go ahead and factor out dp dt and I'll set that equal to zero because I'm trying to find the points of inflection. The, the points of inflection occur where the second derivative is zero. And we know that the dp dt is not zero. That would mean that we would have a constant solution. We're not interested in constant solutions. We're interested in solutions that vary over time. And so that means that the a minus 2bp uh, would have to be 0, or p equals a over 2b. So now we know that the logistic curve has a point of inflection when p equals a over 2b. Now this a over 2b uh, should be familiar. I remember our critical points for the logistic equation are p equals 0 and p equals a over b. So uh, p equals a over 2b is the midpoint between them. So halfway between the two critical numbers, there is going to be an inflection point. So what would these curves look like? Well, remember that we have two critical points, p equals 0 and p equals a over b. p equals a over b is an attractor. That means as you go from left to right, the solution curves are going to get closer, asymptotically closer to the line, p equals a over b. Um, p equals 0 is asymptotically unstable. That means that as you move to the right, the curves are going to move away from p equals zero. So, uh, and then there's a, a point of inflection uh, right between, so halfway between p equals zero and p equals a over b. 
there'll be a point of inflection here. Now, if you have your initial population larger than A over B, this really doesn't make sense uh, because remember that A over B in our model is that capital K value, the carry capacity. So um, I guess you could have an initial population which is larger than the carrying capacity, but then if the carrying capacity truly is the maximum population, then you'll lose population over time until you uh, reach that carrying capacity. Of course, now you can see that one of the issues with this model is that you can only asymptotically approach the carrying capacity. It assumes a continuous uh, population. Of course, that doesn't make sense. You can't have half of a, a, an individual, whether it's a bacteria or a, a cat or a human. So, you know, there's some flaws with the model, but it, it, I guess it would make sense that if you had a population, initial population, which is more than the carrying capacity, then the population would immediately decrease towards the carrying capacity. Now, if I have a, an initial population which is below my point of inflection, then I'm going to grow and uh, asymptotically approach my carrying capacity which is A over B or that capital K value. And the shape of the curve is that it's going to be concave up until the population is A over 2B. And uh, then it starts to be concave down and asymptotically approach the A over B value. And then uh, if my initial population is more than A over 2B, but less than A over B, I get a, a same type of curve. It's just my inflection point is in a different location. So again, I'm concave up until the population is A over 2B. And then the curve is concave down. So let's examine uh, a model here. So a student carries a flu virus to an isolated college campus, which has a population of 3,000 students, staff, and faculty. Uh, I have to apologize. I, I kept writing just students, but whenever you see students here, really I meant to say people, uh, I want to include faculty and staff. So I, I guess I didn't want to write down uh, students, faculty and staff, but I could have just written people. So please uh, just understand students in this pro example really means or number of students means the number of people. So the big assumption here is that the rate at which the virus spreads is proportional to the product of the number of students infected and the number of students times the number of students not infected. And so we're gonna to try to determine the number of people infected after 10 days, given that X represents the number of people infected. And after four days, we had 60 people out of the 3000 infected. So we initially only on day one, we only had one person infected. By day four, we had 60 people infected. And we'd like to know how many were infected after 10 days, according to our model. So the number of people infected is X. We have a 3,000 total. So the number of people not infected is 3,000 minus X. And we're assuming that the rate at which the number of people are infected is proportional to, so K is just a constant of proportionality. So it's proportional to 
the number of people infected times the number of people not infected. And so we can solve this using separation of variables. Uh, in order to integrate the left-hand side, I'll have to use the partial fraction decomposition. So here's the work that I used to find my partial fractions decomposition. Notice that both A and B are 1 over 3,000. So I go ahead and factor out that common factor, put it in front of the integral, and then integrate both sides. So on the right-hand side, I just get K times T plus a constant C1. On the uh, left-hand side, I'll get a difference of logs. Just remember this minus sign comes from the minus x in the denominator. And I'll do the usual manipulations with the properties of logs and then exponentiate both sides. And uh, I'll call this plus or minus e to the c1 power. I'll call that a new constant c2. And I'll also raise each power to the power of 3,000. Uh, so that uh, I get uh, just x over 3,000 minus x. Of course, now I get e to the power of 3,000 kt. And my constant c2 is actually plus or minus e raised to the 3,000 c1. But it's still just a constant. All right, so let's see if we can impose our... Uh, initial condition that at, at initially there's only one uh, person infected. And that tells me that the C2 constant has to be 1 over 2,999. The next step would be to find this value of K. And in order to find the value of K, I'll use the other information given, which is that on day four, we had 60 people infected. So in the place of x, I'm going to go ahead and replace 60. And then in place of t, I'm going to replace 4. And now I'm just left with an algebra problem. So I went ahead and multiply both sides by 2,999. And then I'm going to take the natural log of both sides and solve for k. And I'll just use an approximation here. And I'll find k is about 0 0.000343. But in my model, I don't really use k directly. I multiply it by 3,000. So 3,000 k is what I'm uh, interested in. And that is a more reasonable number to talk about, 1.0286, approximately. So now we have our model. And if I wanted to then uh, find the number of people infected on day 10, uh, I just have to do some substitutions. I'll go ahead and substitute t equals 10 and pull out my calculator, calculate what is 1 over 2,999 times e to the 10.286 power. I get approximately 9.7718. Now just solve this for x. And I find that uh, on day 10, you're going to have around 2,721 people. So I suppose this is more of a worst case scenario. What are the things that we're, we're not taking into account? We are assuming that the spread of the disease is proportional to the number of interactions between infected and uninfected people. And uh, and the number of interactions is proportional to the number of in, the product of the number of infected people times the number of uninfected people. 
And um, so we're not taking into account that, you know, are people doing taking measures like wearing masks or washing their hands and face often, not touching their face? Uh, are the sick people being uh, isolated and staying in bed, and not interacting with other people? So there's a lot of things that the model does not take into account, but certainly this would be a worst case scenario. The uh, logistic curve for this particular model is this blue curve here. Here's our P equals zero. And then the carrying capacity would be 3000. So it doesn't actually reach that. It's asymptotically approaching it. But here we start uh, at day four with 60 people infected. And then eventually we get to a very high rate of acceleration. And by 10, day 10, we have uh, more than 2,700 people infected. Let's look at another example. Here we're actually given the differential equation and an initial condition. So here we're assuming that uh, initially there's only 5,000 people living in the suburb. T here is measured in months in this model. So we want to answer two things. What's the limiting value? What's the carrying capacity of the population? And at what time will the population reach half of its carrying capacity or limiting value? Well, we don't have to do much work since we're given the model. This model is uh, based on this logistic model. And so we're just trying to find capital K. So R then just by lining this up, it must be 10 to the minus 1. And so uh, this 10 to the minus 7 right here is going to be r over k. So if I take reciprocals, k over r would be 10 to the positive 7, or k is 10 to the positive 6, 1 million people. So according to this model, the maximum number of individuals that could live in this suburb is a million. So the question is, how many months will it take? Again, based on this model, what is the prediction for the number of months for the population to grow from 5,000 to 500,000? Well, we can go back to the solution that was given for logistic problem. We're just going to go ahead and substitute the given values. So we'll put uh, 10 to the minus 1 in for A, 10 to the minus 7 uh, for B, and 5,000 for P naught. And then we can just go ahead and uh, solve this for T when P of T is 500,000. So uh, just doing some algebra. Uh, the exact value for t is negative 10 times the natural log of 5 over 995, and that works out to be about 53 months. So I don't know how accurate this particular model would be for any realistic scenario. I can't see uh, nearly half a million people moving into a new suburb, but uh, it is what the model says. I think that um, if somebody were trying to actually make a prediction and uh, came up with this result, uh, they would definitely change their model. So either change the A or the B or both. So what are some modifications that could be made to the logistics model? Well, we could assume that the rate is this function which depends on p uh, minus or plus some positive constant there. And what could that constant represent? Well, for example, if you had a fishery, uh, what might be happening is you could be harvesting fish from the population, and that would be the minus h case. Or maybe they're bringing in new fish to add to their fishery and so they're stocking up on more fish, and their stocking rate would correspond to a positive H. 
Or if you're talking about a, a geographic or political entity like a city, state, or country, a positive aid could represent an immigration rate, so additional individuals coming into the population, while a negative age would be an emigration rate, so people moving out of the city or state or country. Uh, we're not going to talk too much about it, but you could use uh, different functions to represent the immigration model. So, for example, a sensible function would be instead of adding a constant, you add a constant times e to the negative kp. So you still have to determine your k and your c there. But this model makes sense in the following way, that if p is small, because we have an e to the negative kp, then the immigration rate is going to be high or relatively high. Uh, particularly if k is a, a small number. Then you have e raised to a uh, negative, or k could be even a negative number. I'm sorry, if k is a negative number, then uh, when the population is small, then we're going to have a lot of people uh, immigrating, potentially. I mean, there'll be space. There could be uh, good schools, good jobs, whatever attracts people. Um, when the population is small, they may want to immigrate. However, when you have a large population, I think we are all aware of the problems of pollution and congestion and uh, you know, high property values, uh, it makes it less attractive. So Im the immigration rate may be relatively low. So that concludes our exploration of uh, population dynamics. And we may see these types of problems again in the course.